Welcome back to MACNA 2020, everyone. I now have the honor of introducing Dr. Greg Lubart. Greg received his Bachelor in Arts in Biology from Gettysburg College in 1981, a Master's in Science in Biology with concentration in Marine Biology from Northeastern University in 1985, and a Vet degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine in 1988. He has worked for a number of large wholesalers of ornamental fishes before joining the faculty at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 1993, where he is currently a professor in aquatic animal medicine and an assistant clinical science department head. You might recognize Dr. Lubart from his invertebrate medicine book. Here to talk about advances in marine aquarium medicine for invertebrates and fishes is Dr. Greg Lubart. Greg, welcome to Macro 2020 Phoenix Rising. Hey, thanks so much. Kevin, I really appreciate the invitation and uh, I'm really honored to be here and I look forward to um, virtually connecting with um, all the attendees. So uh, as Kevin said, I'm going to be speaking on um, advances in marine aquarium medicine for invertebrates and fishes. It's a sort of a big title to get around, but um, we're gonna give it a shot. And when I say advances, I'm mostly gonna be talking about things that have surfaced in the last uh, four or five years. Um, I'm gonna focus on evidence-based information, so from the scientific literature, but I also have some uh, cases that I've worked on recently in fishes, and I thought I would share um, how those cases um, were worked through and the outcomes. And um, again, I'll be available if you have any questions. And my email address is right there. And you are welcome to email me uh, anytime. I will do my best to uh, try to answer your questions or find someone who can. So let's, uh, let's do it. So Kevin mentioned I went to Gettysburg College. It's probably not uh, familiar to many of you. This is a small liberal arts school in Pennsylvania, but I was very inspired by this man, Robert Barnes, and his book, Invertebrate Zoology. And uh, I was pretty much a floundering college student until I took this course. I, I, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian, but my grades really weren't going to get me into vet school. But I just, uh, I was head over heels for invertebrates. And I think largely because of Dr. Barnes and the way he taught. And I went to Bermuda with, uh, with him as part of a course. And I knew I needed to do something to uh, try to get into veterinary school to, to uh, improve my academic standing. Um, so I went on to Northeast University and did my master's, got better grades, and finally got into vet school. And so even though I was hired to teach fish medicine at NC State, um, my training was really in invertebrates, um, both in undergrad and then in graduate school. In fact, I've, I'm going to come clean with all of y'all. Never, I've never had ichthyology. Some people say, oh, are you an ichthyologist? No, far from it. I've never even had an ichthyology course. Um, but I had some opportunities to learn about fish in veterinary school. In fact, I worked in a little pet store in West Philadelphia because I saw fish as an area of untapped potential for veterinary medicine back in the 1980s and then was fortunate to end up employed, as Kevin said, in the ornamental fish industry and, um, and then got the faculty job at NC State. So I, so I started at NC State in uh, January of 1993 and I was very naive and, and sometimes that's really helpful, right? To sort of be naive and enthusiastic. And I wrote a letter to Saunders with my idea of, of, of an invertebrate medicine book. And that was uh, in the spring of 1993. And this is a letter uh, back that said, uh, thanks for your, your idea, but we don't foresee the sales potential for a book on this topic and you know, to market it. And I get that. And maybe that was right back then, but I think in the last, we're talking 27 years, we've seen a lot of advances in, um, invertebrate medicine and invertebrates in captivity. And much of that has been driven by the hobby, by your hobby and by captive uh, propagation of uh, invertebrates, principally for reef tanks and also invertebrates in research. And I know probably most of you aren't involved in research uh, with invertebrates. So some of you are, are, 
And this has been a huge area of growth um, and has produced a lot of really good science that we can apply to our aquariums and, and captive animals. So um, flash forward, Kevin mentioned this book. So this is the second edition that came out in 2011. And uh, I'm busy right now editing the third edition and the goal is to have it out in about a year or the end of next year. So anyway, um, it took a while and it was probably good I didn't take on a textbook as a young faculty member, but as I you know, matured a little and learned, learned sort of the academic ropes, the timing was better uh, about 15 years ago. So at NC State, we do a fair amount with invertebrates um, and, and that's um, really driven by the students to a large degree. Um, we have a course on invertebrate medicine that's offered every other year. We have a club and um, we engage a lot of different faculty and students in, diff in research projects of a wide group of invertebrates and not just marine invertebrates. You see, we also um, have uh, terrestrial invertebrates like tarantulas and scorpions that we work with. So some quick facts. I know many of you um, are very knowledgeable about invertebrates, but I was talking to Kevin before we booted up here and I'm frequently lecturing to veterinary students and veterinarians that um, most of their experience with invertebrates is either eating them or maybe trying to kill them because we have a whole course in the veterinary curriculum on parasitology. And the main goal of that is to kill the invertebrates or prevent them from causing disease. Um, but that's really not our goal here. So uh, I'd like to kind of um, present some basic facts and about invertebrates. And there's a ton of them. It's 95% of the animal kingdom, 40 different phyla. Um, and or that's plural for phylum. And if you think about all uh, the fishes um, um, and um, you know other vertebrates are their own phylum. So there are another 39 or so invertebrate phyla. And uh, there's a exotic animal formula that a lot of uh, veterinarians and uh, vet students use. And there's a chapter in there on invertebrate um, uh, drugs, you know, uh, a formulary on how to treat them. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, this is something that probably a, a lot of you have figured out, but in, invertebrates are, it's, a, it's not really a taxon or it's not a taxon. It's a false taxon. It's just a bunch of animals that have one negative trait in common and as they lack a backbone. And in fact, genetically, certain invertebrates are more closely related to vertebrates than they are to other invertebrates. For instance, um, um, sea squirts, tunicates, they're protochordates. They're fairly closely related and even echinoderms to vertebrates and much more so than they would be to a worm or even a mollusk. So it's not, you can't generalize with this group, you know, uh, a treatment or a diagnostic test for a mushroom coral probably wouldn't work on a slug or a nudibranch. Um, so it's a big group. And I mentioned research before, and here's a, this um, article or this journal volume is about nine years old now, but it was all about, see it says spineless wonders, welfare and use of invertebrates in the lab and classroom. And one reason I throw this slide up there is that invertebrates are on the radar for welfare. Um, and as are fish, but as many of you know, uh, fishes have really come into their own in terms of um, people recognizing them as sentient beings, if you will, that they, it, they feel pain. I mean, I certainly believe that, although there is a camp that doesn't, but I firmly believe they feel pain, that um, you know, they're very aware of their surroundings and that we need to, to treat them accordingly. And, and they're, uh, is a realization that invertebrates, especially cephalopods and crustaceans, I mean, it seems like every week or so an octopus is in the news doing something amazing. And um, 
And this will help all in, invertebrates and our knowledge of how to care for them. So what's out there in the literature? Well, quite a bit. Um, and a lot of it is generated. So you, you kind of have to follow the money, right? Or follow the dollars. I mean, much, much of what we know about fish medicine um, has been um, learned by working with valuable food fish like salmon and, and tilapia and catfish. But a lot of times we can apply that knowledge and that technology to our ornamental fishes. Well, it's similar with invertebrates. You know, 4% of the world's protein that's consumed is cephalopods. You know, maybe not so much in the United States, but globally, squid and cuttlefish and even octopus are widely consumed. And um, bivalves, oysters and clams, scallop, well, scallops more wild caught, but these are huge areas uh, of mariculture. And so there's a lot of knowledge and technology that's been developed and that we can apply to our captive uh, charges. One of the big challenges in veterinary medicine is being able to recognize what's normal. You know, I think most people can look at a dog or a cat or a horse and be able to tell you what's normal or not, but you're talking about a literal handful of species. Fishes, there's about 30,000 species of fishes and invertebrates were in the millions. So I frequently will have to look at both sides of an animal. Like if I see a spot or a hole or a projection that doesn't look normal, I'm like, I think, well, is it on the other side? Is it on the other animals in the tank? So it's important to know what's normal. And as many of you realize a sea hare, this is normal. They, when they're disturbed, they will um, excrete an ink as a defense mechanism. And their blood is not even red, it's blue, right? As most of you probably know, they have hemolymph. That's copper-based and not, not uh, red blood with hemoglobin. But if you show this to a first-year veterinary student, they might think, oh my goodness, it must have been cut, it's bleeding. So, so much comparative anatomy and physiology to try to learn about. So these are the major groups of marine invertebrates that are kept uh, in captivity. This is not all of them, um, but these are some of the groups that, that I work with and that I'm gonna focus on uh, in the lecture. So sponges, you know, 200 years ago, sponges were classified as plants. Think about that. So that's, I mean, that's a long time ago, but not an immensely long time ago. And you can understand that, they don't do much, but in fact, they're pretty cool animals and um, they are common in marine aquariums. Uh, I, have, I have had someone bring me a coral and I've done a coral house call, but I still haven't had a sponge patient, patient yet, um, but it could happen. And I won't go into all the details of the anatomy of sponges, but it's all about water currents. And by generating water currents with ciliated cells, they're able to complete all their bodily functions, reproduction, eating, excretion. And they also rely heavily on symbiotic organisms, much like corals and zooxanthellae or tridacna clams. Um, sponges rely heavily on um, symbiotic bacteria that provide nutrition to the sponge and also provide the colors that you see. Those beautiful, brilliant colors are frequently imparted by the bacteria that live within the sponge tissue. There isn't a lot out there on sponge diseases, um, but sponges are really important sentinel animals like canaries in the coal mine for um, for wild um, environments, for the for their tr mostly tropical, but they also live in more temperate regions, and even if there are some freshwater sponges. But since they're sessile, right? They don't move. Um, they can't get away from sedimentation, increased temperature, pollution. So they're important uh, biological indicators. All right. The selenorates, 
really important group, obviously, maybe the most important group for reef tanks and coral reefs because corals are selenerates. And it depends, you know, taxonomy is all over the place and it's changing. You know, the, the invertebrate taxonomy I learned almost 40 years ago has changed dramatically. But the animals haven't changed for the most part. I mean, they don't really know what group they're in. So fortunately in veterinary medicine, we mostly rely on anatomy and physiology and lifestyle and don't worry a lot about the taxonomy, but it can be important if you're trying to extrapolate treatments or diagnostic plans from one group to another. But the main groups, and this is one, one, one way to look at it would be the tenophores or the comb jellies, hydrozoans, and then your cyphozoans or your jellies. And then the, the most developed, the most advanced are the anthozoans, so that's your corals and sea anemones. And this is an area of very dynamic research, a lot of research and important work trying to figure out coral diseases, mostly in the wild. And many of these problems are related to um, environmental changes in the last uh, couple of decades. Climate change, increasing uh, water temperatures, pH changes in the ocean, pollution. Um, and a lot of these diseases are complex. They're a, the combination of the environment and a pathogen or pathogens, whether that's a fungus or a bacteria and then the animals themselves and the stress they may be under. Um, Frontiers is an open access journal. You can just Google that, very easy to find. And this is a paper that came out last year looking at uh, a problem called stony coral tissue loss disease or SCTLD. And there's been a lot of um, research ongoing to try to figure this uh, syndrome out. Um, this paper is a little older now, um, six years old, looking at um, white band disease. And um, again, I will try to make this um, uh, PowerPoint available to anybody that uh, uh, would like it. And you can see the papers I've referenced and some of the images I pulled from those papers. But this work found that a couple of antibiotics, ampicillin and paromomycin, um, actually stop the progression of this disease. And then if you're a, a, a stony coral, a cropera a reef keeper, you're probably familiar with red bug, which is uh, really not red or a bug. It's got a little bit of red, but this is a copepod, tegastes. And um, there's some evidence, I mean, the hobbyists, uh, figured this out long before uh, veterinarians or uh, scientists um, using some of the um, drugs used to treat uh, dogs and cats. Um, so a lot, of, um, a lot of these compounds are meant to, remember I talked earlier about killing parasites, they're meant to kill um, parasites with chitin and those kinds of things. So these, par these um, parasiticides like interceptor or milbomycin also work um, on crustacean parasites like Tegastes. Um, one thing, and I'm going to touch on this again um, a little bit later, is euthanasia. But um, euthanasia, it's very important in veterinary medicine that we're able to accommodate a humane death for an animal. And if you've ever had dogs or cats, um, sadly, you've probably reached this point where euthanasia was, was required. And veterinary medicine has that figured out. It's very painless, it's quick, very humane. But working with animals like a jellyfish, where they have, don't have a centralized nervous system, it can be trickier. So there's a fair amount of research going on. This paper came out last year by colleagues of mine here at NC State looking at the best way to euthanize a jellyfish. And they found that magnesium chloride at this dose worked well. And the, the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, have a whole jellyfish care manual that is available online. Um, 
I'll just mention this. It's not really a part of invertebrate health, but if you're hobbyists, you should be aware of the polythoa toxicity. I have a couple of links there. We don't have time to, to, to check them out, but if, you're, if you have time or interest, you should. It, they're mostly news stories about people that have experienced polythoa uh, uh, toxicity from, from polytoxin when they were um, cleaning aquariums um, or handling these corals. And I know of anecdotal a case, an anecdotally of a colleague who, whose dog died and the only thing he could figure out was it coincided with him cleaning out his reef aquarium and the dog being in close uh, proximity to some of these corals. Um, I mentioned the SCTLD before and um, this is a paper that uh, came out um, last year also um, looking at this disease and quantifying it. So, um, and one, I just highlighted that one point there that it's transmitted through contact and that corals do respond to antibiotics, which indicates it's probably has a pretty strong bacterial component. Uh, this paper is a couple years old now, but this looks at bleaching um, and loss of disease resistance in Acropora. So if you look at the bottom, I have it highlighted that, um, that these authors found that populations in lower Florida Keys harbor few existing genotypes that are resistant to both warming and disease. So, you know, genomics and looking at DNA has exploded in the scientific world. And so now scientists are able to see, compare animals that are more hardy or, or can survive disease versus those that don't, and they can find a genetic link to that. So one day that might help us really preserve some of these animals. Um, this is just sort of a kind of gee whiz paper, but these authors found that sunscreen when used normally probably is not harmful to corals which is good news. Like I always try to find some good news and I know some of it, especially now, it's just sort of a crazy year, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's some good stuff happening. Um, and um, you know, you don't want to just dump bottles of sunscreen onto a coral reef, but these researchers found that um, they couldn't find evidence where normal sunscreen washing off of somebody would probably hurt corals. Uh, but plastic is a bad, a, a, a bad thing. Probably if, if I could fix one thing in the world, it would be get rid of all the plastic in the environment. Um, it's a huge problem. And um, so this is, uh, these pictures on the left were taken in the Galapagos. I do a lot of field work in the Galapagos. Ironically, I've been, uh, even though I've been there 18 times and worked with many species. I've yet to do research there with invertebrates or fishes. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but that's one of the cool things about being a veterinarian and just kind of taking on challenges and opportunities as they come. But I do a lot of work there with reptiles, seabirds, and marine mammals. But plastic is a huge problem. And it doesn't, this, most of this plastic is not from the Galapagos, just um, geographically and with currents where the Galapagos are situated on the equator in the Pacific, a lot of plastic is deposited there. But this paper from a couple years ago found that uh, plastic is correlated with disease, just the physical um, presence of plastic on a reef. And this is kind of a, a cool paper from a few years ago looking genetically uh, at regeneration in sea anemones. And I think many of you are aware of how um, plastic they are. You know, they can reproduce by just sectioning off a piece of themselves or um, hobbyists um, can take pieces. I mean, fragging is a little bit like that, but you can frag soft corals and frag hard corals and uh, selenerates in general um, are very good at regenerating. And this paper looked at the genetics of that. 
So let's talk about the mollusks. This is an amazing group. And um, these are the three main classes that, uh, that are kept in aquariums. And I call this slide mollusks rule. So I picked three pretty recent publications about some cool stuff about mollusks. So first of all, the oldest non-colonial animal in the world is a mollusk. There's a deep sea cold water clam uh, that lives near Norway and up near the Arctic Circle that it's very common to find them having lived two to 300 years. And you see, I have this circle here. The oldest one known is 507 years. So that goes back a long time. Um, so that, that clam, if you go back 500 years, would have been alive um, in the early 1500s. And then the uh, longest known production for egg brooding of any animal is a deep sea octopus that has been documented to um, brood or, you know, the mother, the, the female cares for its young for four and a half years. So that's pretty cool. And then the largest invertebrate happens to be a mollusk, the colossal squid can weigh almost 500 kilos. So that's 1,100 pounds. And if you look here, um, these are the weight of the ocean giants. And uh, we have many, we have some fish. And then finally we have uh, the colossal squid, the giant clam, and the giant squid take the top three spots for invertebrates. Um, again, not all bad news out there. This is the queen conch. This is kind of a cool paper that looked at um, queen conch development and ocean temperature. And um, these researchers didn't find any uh, problem with the development of the shell of a young queen conch and having the, uh, oh, the water temperature rise a couple degrees centigrade. Now, you know, Global warming, climate change is really bad and it's something we need to get ahead of. But I just, um, I like to see the science and that there are some articles that are saying, well, you know, some animals are gonna be able to, to handle this. So with cephalopods, um, wow, you can take a deep dive into that literature. Um, there's a robo, uh, this is called an octobot. So this is from a paper about four years ago. And um, this is a, a cartoon where a lot of behavioral researchers are looking at, at, at cephalopods, specifically octopuses, to better understand their um, capacity, their sort of uh, mental capacity and um, feeling capacity and ability to um, solve problems. I had a professor in graduate school that said if cephalopods had ever evolved to be terrestrial, they would rule the world because of their manual dexterity, visual acuity, overall intelligence. So maybe they'd be doing a better job if, if they were ruling the world and not people. Um, there is some information out there on on antibiotic use in uh, cephalopods and in other mollusks, um, but mostly we're working on empirical data. Uh, in other words, we tried an antibiotic and it worked, not so much looking at how that antibiotic is uh, metabolized. But this was a paper, this is older, 15 years old, looking at uh, enrofloxacin or batrol in cuttlefish. Um, a lot of focus has been on how to anesthetize or euthanize these animals in captivity. And uh, this paper, and there are several others that looked at uh, magnesium chloride and ethanol as appropriate anesthetics for cephalopods, specifically uh, different species of octopus. This is sort of an interesting paper I found. And if you're a uh, Fish hobbyists, you've probably heard of gas bubble disease or supersaturation disease. 
I would have never thought a clam could suffer from this, but sure enough, they can. And you can even see the air bubble blisters uh, under the periostricum or the outer covering of this bivalve. So that uh, may, may not be something you're going to see in captivity, but I put it in there because it's recently published. And the annelids. So um, these are important animals in reef aquariums. Not so much uh, uh, veterinary medicine involved in this group, but, uh, and recently, in the last 10 years or so, they were sort of reclassified into two major classes, the polychaetes and the clitellata, or the earthworms, oligochaetes, and the leeches. And um, there's some pretty cool research out there looking at um, polychaetes and other annelids because of their regenerative capabilities. And um, as you might imagine, any animal model that might help with human diseases and human conditions um, uh, gains quite a bit of attention. And some invertebrates are being used for Alzheimer's research and um, polychaete worms are really important as um, a, a brain uh, disorder model animal. And then we've got the crustaceans. So this is a really large group, uh, almost 40,000 species. Although most of the crustaceans that we're interested in in the aquarium hobby are decapod crustaceans. And there are about 10,000 species of decapods. And uh, this is a, a video, so we teach this invertebrate class. And this is a blue crab, and you're actually able to uh, determine the heart rate of a blue crab. Or our veterinary students really like when you can apply more standard diagnostic techniques to invertebrates like a blue crab, and that. Um, coincidentally, that's Eric Anderson, who's the head veterinarian at Odyssey. And I know we were going to be real time in Arizona, so there's a link to Arizona there. Eric trained here at NC State. And then finally, the echinoderms are all marine. They're one of the few phyla that's entirely marine. They're about 6,000 species, and they include, of course, sea urchins and sea stars. Uh, we're able to do quite a bit with echinoderms. We can uh, collect hemolymph from them. Um, you may be familiar with sea star wasting disorder, or they call it sea star wasting disease, but most people believe it's more of a syndrome or a disorder with a lot of different factors involved. Um, temperature, precipitation, and... Um, different kinds of pathogens. Um, and then some other cool diagnostic stuff that's come out recently. This is uh, out of the University of Florida, establishing a diagnostic technique for salomocentesis. So that's removing fluid from the abdomen of the sea star. And uh, while they were doing that, they also did some um, CAT scan imaging of the sea stars. That's pretty cool stuff. Now, moving on to fishes. So I know I uh, focused on invertebrates, but I also want to talk about advances in fish medicine. And um, I want to start with uh, anesthesia and analgesia. These are pretty hot topics in veterinary medicine. And it's really important that we can properly anesthetize fish or even euthanize fish. And there has been more and more focus on pain relief in fish. Okay, some other areas where we're seeing um, interesting research is what happens when we put these drugs in an aquarium? You've probably wondered this yourself or, um, or experienced it. And... Um, you know, we say, well, we're going to treat with formalin or we're going to treat with dimelin or praziquantel. And yeah, that's okay. And we can figure out an accurate dose. But 
a lot of this work done at um, uh, Epcot Center at Disney found that um, you really need to monitor the levels if you can. So the results suggest the need for frequent testing and follow-up additions during treatment cycles to ensure therapeutic concentrations. And really, every, as you know, every system is different. I mean, unless you have a, you know, a certain aquarium and it's exactly a carbon copy of the next one, there are a lot of different things at play. The biological load, the nitrifying um, bacteria and other microorganisms. There are a lot of, every system's different. You know, it's just like there's some individual variety between people and, and animals. Um, aquariums are like their own organism and each one is unique. And so this group at Disney found praziquantel and formalin really varied tank to tank and, and levels should be monitored if you have that technology. Okay, I wanted to share uh, a few cases with you that are marine fish cases that I've worked on recently. And just to show you, um, you know, what we're able to do with uh, veterinary medicine. So if you've kept fish, you're probably aware of uh, what, what we call Popeye or exophthalmia. It's a very frustrating disease syndrome. It's, it's not just one disease or one cause. Um, a number of uh, pathological conditions can cause it. And this is a, um, a hi-hat drum with exophthalmia. And we were pretty sure there was air behind the globe. Like shine a light as well. Do you have green light? Inside of the first thing we're going to do more accurate. Move that air and make it Okay. Okay. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Okay. And as soon as you get negative pressure. All right. Nice. How much air was that? About a <laughs> At least half a mil plus some in the Okay. Butterfly. So we'll take it up. That um that worked well. It looked great, but within a couple of days uh that eye had uh be become exophthalmic again. So um we're gonna revisit that fish in a little bit. So this is the amazing healing power of fish. And uh, I, I do some uh, work for a couple of aquariums, some uh, uh, smaller public aquariums in North Carolina. And uh, this is an orange shouldered tang that was beaten up pretty severely by a tank mate, another tang, um, probably cut it up with the caudal peduncle spine. So uh, check this out. The right eye is cloudy, the fins are a little black. And it's got several lacerations here. And the aquarist sent me a video and I, you know, wondering, should we euthanize this fish? And I said, no, I wouldn't. Um, you know, the, it looked pretty strong. It was still up in the water column. So what we did is we, we, they isolated the fish, put it in a hospital tank. We put nitrofurazone in the water. You can see that green tint. So check out the date. That was June it happened on June 15th. I shot this video on June 18th. And then uh, we anesthetized the fish. We had a team. You can tell it's during the pandemic because everybody's wearing masks. And here we're doing virtual teaching. So we're only allowed to have two veterinary students with us in the van to go to this aquarium. So here's another veterinary student uh, we, one of our students is using a laptop to, to uh, record this so she could see it in her house. And you know what? We really didn't do a lot. We gave it some pain medicine. We debrided or cleaned up the wound. We applied some povidone iodine to the wound. And again, so this is June the 18th. This is taken on June the 26th, a week later. Look at that. So it's already... We call that uh, contraction of the wound, um, where the edges are brought together. And this is taken just last week. So it's two months later. Look at that. 
pretty much all healed. And you could tell something probably happened there, but it's an amazing job. And I'd love to take some credit for it, but it's really the fish and the amazing ability fish have to heal as long as they're provided with a good supportive environment. Here's a bonnethead shark that uh, another shark took a pretty big bite out of. Notice the date, February 8th. And that's the ventral surface. It was lucky the eye was preserved. And uh, the veterinarian sutured up uh, what she could. And look at that on March 29th. So that's about seven weeks later. So fish are pretty tough um, as long as they're given the opportunity to heal. And really that's good water quality, low st reducing stress, good nutrition. This is a uh, Mahara that we think another fish um, beat up. You know, let's face it, some fish just don't like other fish. And uh, this fish looks really rough. I mean, it's got severe injury to its left eye. Its fins are pretty ragged. Its mouth looks a little cockeyed here. And that's one month later, the same fish. So it's still, the eye's not normal, but that fish um, did well. And just with good supportive care and some nitrofurazone in the water. I know some veterinarians, you know, we, we want to be careful using antibiotics and nitrofurazone has some um, potential to cause harm to people. But I think if it's managed well and disposed of appropriately, um, it, it, it has its place in uh, fish medicine. Okay, that high hat, we eventually decided to um, take the eye out. So there it is on January 27th of this year. And here's the surgery. So for a case like this, we're gonna, uh, it's a pretty quick surgery. So we've got her under anesthesia. And if you haven't seen like fish movie. eye surgery before, it's pretty dramatic. The eyeball is quite large and leaves a very big defect. Fish, most fish, uh, have pretty big eyes compared to their Do you body. want me to clamp that? And then no, I would it? just cut it. You do want to be a little bit careful. Yeah, you Normally what I'm doing here is poking. I think I had a, my intern was doing that surgery. And you do have to be, sometimes you get a fair amount of bleeding, so you have to make sure you apply pressure to stop the bleeding. And this is the fish. Uh, a few days, uh, post, maybe just a day afterwards, it was doing a lot of circling. And this is it about a week later, eight days later. I wanted to see Tia, but... I wanted to put it through the CAD scan, but I didn't. Oh, not as much. I think you appreciate it. I wanted to see Tia, but pretty well. You want to see what? I wanted to put it through the CAD scan, but I didn't. Oh, I think you appreciate it. This fish lost its eye somehow. I don't know if it was trauma or surgical. But one-eyed fish can do pretty well, and they will fill in that orbit with um, scar tissue, and I think are still quite displayable. Okay, this is kind of a, another eye. I mean, fish ophthalmology, it's a lot of what we do with uh, captive fish. Their eyes are big. They don't have eyelids. We frequently have them in uh, contained unnatural areas where they can traumatize their eyes or a, a, a tank mate can injure their eye. Um, this was actually different. I thought, so this is the left side of the fish. This is the right side. There's the mouth. And I thought this was cancer. That was the top of my differential list. So we CAT scanned this fish. The owner was very dedicated and wanted to work up the fish as best uh, as we could. So we did a CAT scan and we uh, found that the eye the bad eye, uh, the lesion was contained in the orbit. 
So we didn't want to put this fish through a lot of surgery if that lesion was in, getting close to the brain or eroding the skull. It wasn't. So you're always learning in this game, even someone that's been around uh, for a while. And I had anesthetized puffer fish before, but I'd never put one on our recirculating system. I'd anesthetize them for tooth trims. And someone, you know, we got the anesthesia going, we induced the fish, we had it on the machine, and someone said, Lubart, that fish is gonna pop. And I looked down, I saw the puffer, literally I thought it might pop. So we yanked the tube out of its mouth and we had a pretty big team there. We had ophthalmologists, they removed the eye. You can see the eye coming out here. And the fish stayed puffed up through the whole 45 minute procedure, kept breathing. Uh, it's my colleague, Dr. Applegate. And I'm gonna show you how we uh, decompressed it. They don't pull it. Can we get so, a towel on the floor? That was Dr. Applegate's idea, was to put a red rubber catheter in there. And a, you can, now if you look closely, you can probably see, he's using gravity, it's just like siphoning out an aquarium, except he's siphoning out a puffer. You can see the opercular movements there. Puffer for shit, yeah. Where's the N and O in the needle? And, Bailing out of boat. No switch. Puff did great. What do is tiny, oh, gentle yeah. pressure. <laughs> and keep the, oh, and just keep the red line line gravity. Yeah, and keep that too keep below the puffer. Or Four fingers, if you can. Uh, we can switch places. Yeah. Yeah. Residents. And that's Puff. Puff also got a little tooth trim. And that's Puff a couple years later. I, unfortunately, it's the left eye, but the fish is doing great. And the diagnosis, we, we sent the eye off for testing and it turned out to be a fungal uh, infection, probably secondary to trauma and not uh, cancer after all. And that's what I have. So we're ending with a Sally Lightfoot crab and I hope you learned some things and I will be available to answer questions. Thank you very much, Greg. And if anyone has uh, questions for Greg, they can go to magna.org slash questions, uh, either during this talk, um, you, you would have known that URL already or later today, and Greg will be at the Q&A session um, at the end of the day. Uh, very informational, thank you very much, Greg. And um, I hope to uh, be more involved with aquatic animal medicine and get the, the MACNA community more involved in the future. Uh, Greg, if people wanted to find more information uh, from an aquatic vet or find an aquatic vet, where can they do that either online or in person? Yeah, I think the two best uh, resources are the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association or WAVMA. And that website is WAVMA, W-A-V-M-A dot org. And also, at least in the United States, the American Association of Fish Veterinarians uh, or AAFV, and that website is fishvets.org. Thanks, Kevin.